Hi, I'm Clara Keegan. I'm a family physician at the University of Vermont with a primary practice in South Burlington where I see people of all ages and I have a special interest in women's health. I'm coming to you from my dining room today to demonstrate some gynecologic procedures that we frequently use in family medicine. We're going to start with the woman-centered pelvic exam, which is applicable to women as well as trans men and people of non-binary gender who also need gynecologic care. So we're going to start with setting up the patient for the woman-centered exam. I always speak to the patient initially wearing her clothes and then ask her to get undressed while I'm out of the room and then ask her to drape her midsection with a sheet so that she feels covered up and comfortable. Whenever we're doing this exam, we need to remember that a large number of women have experienced sexual trauma of some kind. So this exam is intrusive at best and can be re-traumatizing for some people. So it's important to think about what language we use and how we use our hands and our instruments in the most kind and considerate way possible. When we're thinking about doing a general pelvic exam, we usually will use a speculum if we need to look at the cervix, and I have a few different speculums here to show you. The speculum traditionally has been metal, and it comes in two different shapes. The narrow shape is called the Peterson shape, and the wider shape is called the grave shape, and it's a little bit narrower at the base and then widens up at the tip of the blades. The Peterson shape is more appropriate for a woman who has never had a baby or for a woman toward the end of her reproductive life after menopause, whereas the grave shape is more appropriate for someone who has had vaginal deliveries because the vaginal sidewalls will fall in toward the inside of the vagina, and the narrow Peterson shape will not give you a good enough view in that situation. There are also different lengths. You can see that these two specula are very similar in length, but there are also longer ones that are available. And this is important because women who are obese have extra adiposity all around the pelvis. It extends the link that you need to place the speculum through to get to a view of the cervix. In my practice, I usually will use the plastic speculum. These are disposable. They have, nothing about the instrument is sharp, but the edge of the blades is a little bit smoother. They aren't as cold of a sensation. And I have a light that I can plug into the base, which puts the light directly where I want to see. There's, these come in three sizes. This is the smallest size and the largest size, so you can imagine an intermediate size as well. And these all have the Peterson shape, though they get wider and longer as you progress through the different sizes. All of the specula have two different ways that you can adjust them. So first you need to be able to hold the blades open. So once we've placed the speculum, we use our finger to, we use our other hand to tighten this screw and that will hold the blades of the speculum open so that it doesn't fall closed. There's another place that we can adjust at the base as well, which allows us to open and get a wider view at the introitus. There are a few different places where what I say in this presentation is a little different from what I think the standardized patients teach, and I have some reasons for that. I think that they are doing a really great job of teaching a woman-centered pelvic exam. There are a few little points that are difficult in actual practice. So I believe that in the standardized patient session, you're taught to open the speculum and then close the, the screw with the same hand. And you could keep the other hand completely separate from touching any of the instruments. That becomes impossible to make that distinction when we're doing intrauterine procedures. So I don't really worry about it when I'm using this screw. With the plastic specula, there's also they also have ways to hold them open. So there's a little ratchet here, and I will. it makes a clicking sound when you open it. So to avoid that clicking sound, what I usually will do is lift up that plastic piece with my thumb so I can open it silently and then it will stay open. There's also a adjustable section here to make a greater view at the introitus, which is really helpful for procedures, especially something like colposcopy where we need to get a broad view of the cervix. For the model, I usually will use the Peterson speculum um, because the gray speculum doesn't work quite as well with the models that we have here. So when I'm about to begin my exam, I check in with the patient. I ask her to put her feet on the extended table and use her feet to bring her hips toward the end of the table. I then bring the footrests out from the exam table, which you can't see here, and I help her get her feet into the footrests. 
Then I assess with the sheet lifted up whether her hips need to come down any further. And if she does need to come down a bit further, I place the back of my hand against the end of the table and ask her to come a little bit further or I say, there might, there's a little more room for you to come down further until you reach the back of my hand, just so that she knows it's the back of my hand and not the front. The back of the hand is less threatening than the front of the hand. So she might bring her hips down a little bit further so that the back of her buttocks is able to touch the back of my hand. So we're getting ready to place the speculum now. And I usually do use a little bit of lubricant on the plastic speculum. The lubricant can be an interfering substance on the pap test, so the pathology department would like us to avoid using lubricant, but I do find that it helps make the exam more comfortable. An alternative, especially with the metal speculum, is to run the speculum under warm water, which helps prevent it from being as cold as it would be otherwise and provides a little bit of lubrication as well. But I just put a little bit on the lower blade of the speculum, which then washes off along the, the posterior vagina so that it doesn't really get in the way of the cervix at all. So when I'm about to put the speculum in, it, you want it to end up horizontal but the opening looks like it's going to go vertically. But if you place it vertically, you're putting the least smooth part of the instrument against the most sensitive part of the anatomy, which is the clitoral hood and the urethral meatus. So I usually place it at a little bit of an angle. Again, I don't want the first thing that the patient feels to be my examining hand on the vulva. So I put the back of my hand on the inner thigh and say, this is my hand. This is the back of my hand. Then I put two fingers on the perineal muscle this is the muscle I'd like you to relax. Understanding that asking someone to relax during this exam is a little bit silly. If I feel a lot of tension in that muscle, I'll ask the patient to drop her bottom against the table if possible, and usually I can feel the muscle relax. I place the speculum at a slight angle and then quickly restitute it to be horizontal. I'm now going to aim posteriorly toward the rectum. I'm going to open up the speculum a little bit here, which is a little bit easier to do before you place it, if you remember to do it beforehand, but it can be done at this point or at any point during the exam. So I now have a little bit more visibility at the opening. And now I'm going to open the, the speculum a little bit and I'm looking for the smooth surface of the cervix. The vaginal walls have folds on them. I'm trying to see if I can show that. So there's folds of the vaginal walls. If you see those skin folds, that is not the cervix. You're going to redirect posteriorly, see the smooth surface of the cervix, and open. Then you swoop the bottom blade of the speculum underneath the cervix and tighten the screw to keep the speculum in position. This pair of illustrations demonstrates two possible appearances of the cervical os. Figure A is the non paris cervix. This is the typical appearance seen in a woman who has never delivered a child. You may also see this small round cervical os in someone who never labored and gave birth by cesarean section, for example, for breech presentation. Also, after menopause, the os can again look small and round. Figure B is the Paris cervix. This is the appearance of a cervix which has dilated in labor and then relaxed after delivery. This could be seen in someone who delivered by cesarean section after dilating partially or completely, but had a rest of labor either in dilation or descent. Sometimes a woman who has never given birth has an os that looks more Paris than non-Paris. When I'm collecting a pap, test from the Paris cervix, I will usually use my endocervical brush and try to make sure I get both corners of the linear aspect of the opening. I'm going to show you the devices that we use. This one is the endocervical brush. It looks sort of like a mascara wand. This is the paddle that looks like a mitten. And then this is the broom. The broom is designed to collect both an endocervical and an ectocervical sample at the same time. But you can see that the endocervical brush bristles are not as long as the endocervical brush, and the ectocervical bristles of the broom are not as wide 
as the paddle. So I don't think that you get the same sensitivity. You might miss some things using only the broom, which is why I always use both the brush and the little paddle mitten thing. I don't know what its official name is. Now I'm gonna collect the pap sample. So the way I do it is to use the paddle first. The fat part of the mitten goes at the cervical os and then the whole mitten rotates around 360 degrees to collect a sample from the outside of the cervix. I then use the brush to insert into the cervical os and usually it can bury completely in there. It's a little hard with the rubber. And that only needs to rotate about 90 to 180 degrees because it has 360 degrees of bristles. If someone is using the broom, the long pieces of the broom go at the os and the short pieces are on the ectocervix. And that broom needs to go around one, two, three, four, five times to be considered an adequate sample. That would then go into the pap vial for collection. In some women, you may see a cervical ectropion. The endocervix is lined with columnar cells and the ectocervix is lined with squamous cells. The squamous cells are a paler color of pink than the columnar cells. In adolescents and in women who are taking contraceptive pills, there is often a large area of columnar cells on the outer portion of the cervix. This is a normal process. Those columnar cells undergo squamous metaplasia to become squamous cells. There is a line where the columnar cells and the squamous cells meet, which is called the squamo-columnar junction. The area of squamous metaplasia is the area where HPV tends to cause changes in the cells that lead to neoplasia and cancer. So this is the area that we definitely want to sample with the PAP. If the broom or the mitten-shaped paddle does not sample the full squamo-columnar junction with a single sweep, I recommend doing a second sweep along the squamo-columnar junction to make sure that you are capturing the cells of the transformation zone. The pap specimen goes into the thin prep vial. And if you have an assistant with you to open it for you, that's really handy. Otherwise, you're sort of holding onto the sample collection devices in one hand while you open it with your other hands. Then these sample brushes go right into that fixative and then you brush them off of each other to get the cells into the fixation solution. This is a fixative, so we don't just put the devices in there and leave them sitting there because then the cells could fix to this collection sample and not go in the fixative. While we're looking at the cervix, I'm going to show you how we would collect the gonorrhea and chlamydia swab. So this comes with two swabs. One says cleaning swab, not for specimen collection. And you would use that if there was some mucus on the cervix that you needed to clear away. The other one says endocervical and male, your collection swab for endocervical and male urethral specimens. And this is a thin Q-tip, which goes directly at the cervical os. So the Q-tip goes right inside and it needs to sit there for about 10 to 15 seconds, soaking up the DNA. And once you've collected that sample, it goes in this vial, you open up the top, put the Q-tip in, break it off at this little notch, and leave the Q-tip in the vial to go to the lab with the sample. We also can screen for gonorrhea and chlamydia directly from the pap specimen. So there is an order that allows us to do that screening from thin prep as opposed to from the endocervix. You can use the same Q-tip to collect a sample from male patients from the penile urethra. It is not very comfortable. So usually if I'm going to get that testing from men, I do a dirty urine. The key with the dirty urine is that it can't be a clean catch like you would do for a urine culture. 
it needs to be a dirty urine. So we're using the theoretically sterile urine to wash the gonorrhea or chlamydia DNA from the tip of the urethra or from the, um, the cervix in the female patient into the urine collection cup. So it's most accurate if it's done first thing in the morning when the person hasn't urinated overnight, or they need to have not urinated for at least an hour before you collect the sample then we only want the patient to void about 15 to 30 cc's into the cup. They don't do any wiping beforehand like they would for a clean catch urine. They just pee directly into the cup and stop the flow of urine once they've put about 20 to 30 cc's into the cup. And that's how you get the dirty urine sample. Those instructions are really important. If the lab gets a, a sample of urine that has more than 30 cc's, they won't run the test. After I've done that speculum exam, I'm going to remove the speculum. So to help avoid it closing harshly on the cervix, I'm going to use the thumb of my left hand to apply pressure on this, this part of the speculum while I loosen the knob. And that way, the speculum will stay open. I'm then going to remove the speculum slightly until I see that the blades have cleared the cervix. And then I can release the pressure of my thumb and allow the blades of the cervix to close gently while I remove the speculum without causing any discomfort. After we do the speculum exam is when we would typically do a bimanual exam if we needed to check the position of the uterus and the cervix. We usually don't do that first because we don't want to apply the lubricant directly to the cervix because it then can be an interfering substance for the pap test. I take off the glove of my left or non-dominant hand because this hand is going to be doing an abdominal exam. I apply some lubricant to my gloved right hand and the index and middle finger of that hand are going to go in the vagina, while my left hand is pressing on the abdomen to feel the uterus and cervix. The purpose of my left hand is to push the gynecologic organs in toward the vagina so that I feel them with my right hand. So I give the patient a warning again. This is the back of my hand. I'm going to do the internal exam to check the position of your uterus and cervix. Again, cold gel and pressure and the examining fingers go posteriorly until they can feel the cervix. You can't see at all what I'm doing. This is the problem with trying to teach pelvic medicine. But trust me, I can feel the cervix against the tips of my two fingers. Now when I use my left hand and I push on the patient's abdomen, I can feel her uterus between my two hands. And I can feel that this uterus feels a bit enlarged. It feels about the size of a grapefruit, which would be about a 10 to 12 week size uterus. I can also use my left hand to sweep along each side, trying to feel the ovaries. The ovaries are really sneaky. Sometimes you'll just feel them and then they'll be gone. And I don't feel the ovaries on this particular patient. After I've completed that internal exam, I can remove my hand. Sometimes the uterus is retroverted, which means that instead of pointing up toward the patient's abdomen, it's pointing backward toward her rectum. In that situation, if you really needed to confirm that the uterus was retroverted, what you would be feeling on the internal exam when you did the abdominal exam is you would not feel the firm uterus between your two hands. Instead, you might feel it against your, your posterior finger, against your middle finger toward the rectum. It can be hard to tell whether that's a uterus or whether there might be some stool in the rectum. If you really need to confirm that the uterus is retroverted, you can do what's called a rectovaginal exam. It's very important to let the patient know that this is what you're going to do. This involves using the index finger in the vagina and the middle finger in the rectum. So you let the patient know that you need to do this exam and that she may feel pressure as if she needs to have a bowel movement, but she won't have a bowel movement. I make sure I have plenty of lubricant gel on my examining hand. I place my middle finger toward the rectum and my index finger toward the vagina. Lots of pressure and I can place both fingers inside at once. And then if the uterus is retroverted, I can definitely feel it against my middle finger. I do not do this exam very often, it's very intrusive. It can also be useful in the setting of endometriosis or in the setting of pelvic cancer because sometimes endometrial tissue or cancer tissue collects in the cul-de-sac between the uterus and the rectum and you can feel nodules of tumor tissue using the rectovaginal exam. But in primary care, it's not something that we need to do very often, fortunately. After I'm done with the exam, I help drape the patient again. I help move her feet away from the footrests and back onto the extended table. And then I push the footrests away so that they aren't hanging out all the time during every other exam.